I want to say shalom and uh, welcome everyone to the second lecture in the Ghetto Fighters House new international online series, Talking Memory. My name is Medin Shachar and I'm an educator and a guide at the Ghetto Fighters House. Uh, once again, we have a very diverse audience today from all over the world. People have come together, Paul, <laughs> to learn from you, our guest speaker, and we are honored to have you here with us today. Uh, his talk, Paul's talk, will be uh, Beyond the Gaze, you can see that on the slide, of the perpetrator, closer readings of Holocaust photographs. And before we start all the formal introductions, a few housekeeping notes. As always on these Zoom meetings, uh, the lecture is being recorded and it will be available in a few days on our uh, Facebook page as well as our YouTube page. So you can look for, the, for that in a few days. Uh, and of course you can share with friends who couldn't come uh, today. As you all noticed, you've been put on mute and that's in order to avoid unwanted noise during the lecture. It is unfortunate that we can't have sort of like a little chat beforehand, but there are almost 200 people. So we have everybody on mute, at least for this portion of our session today. But of course you can use the chat box and send questions throughout the lecture. And I will try to present as many as possible within the time frame that we have tonight, today. Uh, after the formal lecture and the Q&A, uh, Paul would like to try something, and we want to try too. Uh, to, uh, if you want to take part in a more interactive session, uh, an open mic session, I guess you could say, uh, we'll let anyone who wants to leave after the official lecture leave the room, and we'll stay with a smaller group and uh, open up the mics for a more interactive uh, experience. Um, and finally, look for uh, a link to our next lecture in two weeks, August 30th on Sunday. It'll be with Elizabeth uh, Reinecki, who is going to give an, an amazing talk, Chasing Portraits of Great Granddaughters, uh, Quest for Her Lost Art Legacy. So we'll put a link in the chat box throughout uh, the evening, and um, you can find it again on our Facebook page and uh, get the details. And we will send out a mail to everyone who's participating today uh, with, with a registration form. Uh, and now before introducing our guest speaker, so we can have a little more of his tea. Uh, I would like to give the microphone to Igal Cohen, CEO of the Ghetto Fighters House, who will say a few words. Good evening. The last time I met Paul was after a conference in Sweden, just before the outbreak of the pandemic that changed our lives. We agreed then to cooperate and could not imagine that six months later, we will be able to meet only virtually and connecting hundreds of people from around the world for a moving learning session. I hope to continue this tradition and await the moment that we can meet physically here at the Ghetto Fighters House and elsewhere in the world. Thank you, Paul, for your contribution to the lecture series. I wish all of us an interesting encounter. Thank you, Maiden. Thank you, Igal. And now about our distinguished guest. Paul Salmons is a curator of Auschwitz not long ago, not far away. This major new traveling exhibition produced by Spanish company Musealia, right? Musealia presents mm -hmm. some 700 original artifacts to new audiences in Europe and North America. He is also chief curator of the exhibition Seeing Auschwitz, produced by Musealia through UNESCO and the United Nations. This powerful exhibit re examines iconic photographs of the largest killing center in human history, challenging us to think again about what each one really reveals about that place and that time. The talk today will draw on concepts and photographs from the recent Seeing Auschwitz exhibition. A world-renowned expert in Holocaust education and consultant on numerous international projects, Paul worked for 10 years at the Imperial War Museum in London, helping to create the United Kingdom's national exhibition on the Holocaust and developing its distinctive educational approach. He was a founding director of the Center for Holocaust Education at University College in London, 
served on the United Kingdom delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance for some 20 years, and has consulted on numerous international projects, including currently for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum as their first Leslie and Susan Gonda Foundation Fellow. I know that Paul's pedagogical philosophy on Holocaust education shaped my work as an educator. And I am looking forward, as I'm sure we all are, to learning from you tonight. Uh, so Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Medine and Yigal, for that kind introduction and for the invitation to uh, join you tonight. Um, this is a real honor to be part of your international lecture series. As Yigal mentions, um, we're lucky, of course, to have this kind of technology which can bring us together, so many of us, hundreds of people across different countries, even across continents. I mentioned that to my youngest um, child, Kai, uh, a couple of days ago that we'd be doing this, and uh, he said, well, you better not mess it up then. So uh, that was, uh, <laughs> with that little bit of pressure, I guess we'll kick off. Um, as you mentioned, Maydeen, this will draw very much upon a new exhibition that we opened simultaneously in Paris and in New York City um, for UNESCO and for the United Nations, uh, seeing Auschwitz and we'll look at uh, some of the iconic imagery from um, Auschwitz and use this as a way into thinking about how we read Holocaust photographs and the importance of these images to our understanding of the past. Um, to begin with, I would just like to ask each of you to think about what mental image you have of Auschwitz. When you hear that name, what do you see in your mind's eye? I don't mean what do you know about Auschwitz or what do you think or feel about Auschwitz, but what do you see? What kind of scene um, emerges for you? Have a moment just to think about the kind of how you describe that scene. Uh, maybe if you have access to the comment section, you could even spend a few seconds just to uh, jot down those few thoughts and we'll have a sense, a hope of a kind of collective imagination of that place. We'd be interested to see what's revealed by this wide and diverse audience. Not sure if I can see those, uh, yeah, I can see the chat. Okay, see these coming in, thank you. Coming in fast. Okay. Oh. Okay, so it's the image that I'm interested in. Um, a squiggle seems to have appeared on my screen. I don't know if you can see that. I don't know how I got there, but um, hopefully that maybe a glitch that continues. Thinking about that image and where that um, impression of the past comes from, uh, I can, this is the sort of image I was seeing coming up on those comment sections then. Many of you talked about Birkenau. This is an image of Auschwitz-Birkenau, one part of the Auschwitz complex. Um, I saw references to the trains. We see here a, a train has just arrived on the ramp through the, um, the gate tower at the back, so-called gate of death. We see hundreds of people on the platform, crowds of people who've uh, spilled out of this train and uh, they're being divided up into two large groups, men and older boys on one side, women and younger children on the other. We see men in striped uniforms, we see other men in uh, SS uniforms, over on this side, uh, if you can see my cursor, I hope you can see that as the screen. Oh, another strange squiggle there as well. Can you see that as well, Maydeen, on my screen? I'm not doing that. I'm not quite sure why that's occurring. I hope we haven't got some kind of hack going on here. Yeah. Let's see. Um, we'll persevere. Yes. So the um, scene on on the right hand side of the screen, we can see a man disheveled uh, in a state of semi undress. Actually, he's lost a shoe, he's lost his trousers. Uh, we can see a kind of scene within the scene unfolding here. 
Um, he's not actually looking at the man in the SS uniform. You'll notice there's a, a, a man in striped uniform just close to him, presumably an interpreter, um, and some exchanges going on here. And we see others in the scene behind him, looking over, clearly interested in what's unfolding here, and even those at the front, some of them are kind of turning towards him. So some kind of incidence is, is happening here. But the reason I, I show this image to begin with is because I think it contains so many of the, uh, the iconic images that we have of Auschwitz, as was revealed in those um, chat messages, I think. This is a very strong impression of, I think, what most of us think of when we hear that name, Auschwitz. And indeed, to some extent, even what we think about when we hear the word the Holocaust, because to some extent, of course, Auschwitz has become um, the central motif of the Holocaust. Now, clearly the Holocaust was much more than just Auschwitz. Um, although Auschwitz was the largest of the killing centers, it was the largest concentration camp. Um, people from, Jewish people from all over Europe were sent to Auschwitz and were murdered there on arrival. Uh, it does have a central place in the history, um, but it occupies an even larger place I think within our understanding of that past. And this is the kind of image that many of us associate then, not only with Auschwitz, but with the Holocaust itself. My interest in um, working on the uh, Seeing Auschwitz exhibition was how far do such images influence our understanding? And does it matter where those images have come from? Um, we are, our imagination, of course, is so influenced by this kind of visual motif. We have a saying that we seeing is believing that uh, to some extent um, it, it has become our kind of touchstone of this past. So I'm interested in the Seeing Auschwitz exhibition and in this uh, talk tonight and I hope in our exchange afterwards to consider the importance of the visual image and to think about um, how useful that image is but also how complicated it can be and what work we need to do to see beyond and outside of this kind of frame. So I think it's important to think about where this image comes from and indeed every other image we have of arrival and selection at Auschwitz-Birkenau. To do that we need to move beyond outside of Auschwitz some hundreds of miles away to the camp of Dora Mittelbau in the Harz Mountains of Germany and to 1945. There, um, where 20, some 20,000 people died in the tunnels and the quarries of that camp and the, amongst the um, sick and the dying, um, as the SS moved away from, uh, retreated desperately away from Mittelbau, Dora, uh, a young woman, Lily Jacob, they amongst the sick and the dying and, and heard a commotion outside as the American soldiers arrived. She staggered outside of her barrack as the Americans came in. She fell to the ground, she collapsed and uh, unseen hands carried her to an SS barrack where she was laid in a bunk. Um, and it was the cold that awoke her. Um, she pulled herself out of bed, searched for some kind of warm clothing opened a drawer next to uh, her bedside and inside that found this photograph album underneath some neatly folded pajamas. Opening that album she saw the images that we hold today in our imaginations of Auschwitz. This single photograph album contains a little under 200 photographs, the only photographs that we have of the arrival and selection at Auschwitz. Here's one of its pages. And again, we see the dividing of the group, the men and the women, um, on that selection ramp at Birkenau. As she turned its pages though, extraordinarily, she actually sees herself looking back out of its pages. Lee Jacob is now 19 years old. Here she is in the center of this image, gazing back at herself some, um, a, a lifetime before, in a sense. 
This photograph album includes photos of the arrival of Lily's own transport to Auschwitz. So although she was liberated in Dora Mittelbau, um, she arrived in Auschwitz with um, Hungarian Jewish men and women from her community. And as she turned the pages, she saw the faces of her murdered neighbors, her murdered community, her aunt, her cousins, her grandparents, her rabbi, and her two younger brothers. Israel, the younger one, just nine years old on the, our left, and next to him, uh, Zelig, 11 years old. The last photograph, the only photograph that you'll have of those little boys who were murdered shortly after their arrival, um, killed in the gas chambers of Auschwitz. But think about the significance and the meaning of these images to Lily Jacob when she discovers this album. Close to death herself, she discovers these last images of her murdered friends and family. The significance of that discovery is only really matched by the historical significance to us today in the sense, as I mentioned, that this is the only record we have, photographic record of these events taking place. Without this photograph album that she finds by chance in this bedside table, we would have none of the images that fill our museums, our exhibitions on Auschwitz and the Holocaust. We'd have none of those photographs that um, are panned across in documentaries of this period, or indeed we wouldn't have the visual iconography that uh, directors use when they make their feature films. When I asked you what was your imagination of your mental picture of Auschwitz, that mental picture really is formed so strongly by this one source. We see these images everywhere we speak about um, Auschwitz, everywhere we represent Auschwitz, we return to this same album. So this was also, this album was also used, its photographs were used in um, post-war trials. It's become our kind of visual touchstone of this past. It means something different to us then today, of course, than it did to Lily herself when she discovered it. She had no understanding quite of its significance in a historical sense. Initially, of course, it meant such a huge amount to her on a personal basis. The image, though, that we see here also, if you think back um, to the uh, first slide I showed you, I included some logos from the various institutions that were involved in um, our exhibition seeing Auschwitz, one of them being Auschwitz Birkenau State Museum. The eyes of this young child, of Lily's brother Israel, have become today the central motif within the Auschwitz Birkenau logo. A little boy looks back at us. But what I want to suggest is that he does not look at us as our witness. Our witness here, of course, is the person who's taken the photograph. This little boy looks at us not as a witness, but as our accuser. He's looking directly at us at the lens, through the lens of an SS soldier, most likely either um, Bernard Walter or um, his deputy in the photographic department at Auschwitz, Ernst Hoffman, a former school teacher. But what he sees, of course, is not us, but this armed SS man pointing a camera at him. And this is an act of extraordinary violence. These children, of course, have no say in what's happening to them here. You can see um, Zelig's expression the older boy next to him, clearly visibly distressed. His furrowed brow, his tense shoulders, his stiff hand, and unsurprisingly, right? I mean, he's, he, he's terrified, I'm sure. So what we are witnessing here is an act of violence, and it's an act of violence that we repeat every time we reproduce this image. The lens through which we see these young children is a pitiless lens. 
And I think it's important, it's significant when we view the images of Auschwitz, that we understand that while the curator that reproduces this image, of course, does so with great empathy and sympathy for the people that we view here, and the visitor engages, of course, with young children on this empathetic level, that's not the intention of the man who took the photograph. You know, we should work hard to understand and to see that actually there is a, another frame here and that our view of Auschwitz is conditioned by that pitiless lens. Let's have a look at some of the implications of that. Here's a page from the album. You'll notice that on the bottom right one of the images is missing. A few images have been removed from this album because just as Lily discovered the faces of some of her relatives, she encountered other survivors who also, looking through its pages, found images of their own murdered family and asking for those photographs, she handed them over. So they're lost to us, but of course gained by those survivors. And it's something to reflect upon, I think, that the last image that someone might have of their loved one is an image which has been taken by that person's murderer. What does that mean? What, does that, what significance does that have? The purpose, though, of the images is clearly not, you know, the, the way in which we use these images today. It's not intended for educational purposes in the sense of trying to understand um, the history and the process of Auschwitz or the Holocaust. Uh, it has a documentary feel, and the way that these images are posted in reveals something of that. If we look at the top two images, we see a kind of narrative emerging, um, a train uh, which on the left has its doors wide open and the uh, only remains of the people there are the belongings scattered in the background. Uh, the train on the right is still closed and awaiting unloading. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, the train on the right has been opened. It's probably not actually the same train, but it's presented in the album as if it is. Um, and people have unloaded and spilled out onto the platform, the other train has disappeared. So in a sense, what the photographer is doing in the compiler of this album is narrating a kind of process of, of, of destruction and the efficiency of that process. That's their concern. It's not a concern with the people that we see on these pages. Again, I think that matters. Let's take a look more closely at that image on the top right hand side. So if we think back to Israel and Zelig, in a sense, they're not the subjects of the photograph, although it's a kind of portrait of them, it is a portrait. They are the objects of the SS man's violent act of taking that photograph. Similarly here, the subject is not the individual people. We see a mass. The Photographer has very deliberately taken up position on the roof of the train. Again, this reveals to us who it could have been that took the photograph. Clearly, it's not a clandestine image. This is a photograph taken in full view, in broad daylight. The photographer would be very visible to those people on the platform. There's nothing secret about this. It's an official photograph, in a sense. And the position that's been taken on the roof of this train is in order to get this panorama. So rather than the individual experience suffering um, tragedy, which is unfolding below, what the photographer appears to be interested in is rather narrating a process of destruction. And again, I think this is important to us because these images, while photographic theorists um, such as Roland Barthes um, have argued this is a, a photograph has a particular truthfulness to us because it has a kind of certificate of presence. It's not like a, an image which has been drawn by hand or painted. It's an image which has been created, of course, by light passing through a camera lens and falling upon photographic paper, a chemical reaction. Uh, in order for a the photograph to exist, 
certainly in the era in which this image was taken, the events had to take place as we see them. The, the events had to unfold as we see them in this place. There's no work of the imagination here. That's what gives it its truthfulness. That's what makes these images so compelling and why um, our imagination, I think, is so shaped by them. However, the, the, uh, there are others, Susan Sontag, for example, who have talked about the limit of this kind of evidence in terms of um, our explanatory understanding. Sontag has argued that uh, photographs are limited in terms of their explanatory usefulness because they are single moments in time. Right? This is a photograph which is capturing a split second, a kind of atom of time. And in order to understand events, in order to explain things, in order to explain the world, we have to understand how things function over time. What I want to suggest here though is that actually within these images, again if we work hard, we can actually see time passing in certain ways. And that therefore they can gain a greater kind of explanatory power. We need to work hard again to see beyond just the simple frame before us. But let's look at what it shows. Um, a foreground, a midground, background. The train itself leads our eye to the background, as do the railway lines. This is, a, again, a professional photographer who has composed this image very carefully. In the background are two buildings. Here I'm trying to indicate this, I hope you can see it with my cursor on the left-hand side, and another one over here with these tall brick chimneys. These are Crematoria 2, Crematoria 3. Um, two of the four uh, Crematoria that were specially built in Auschwitz-Birkenau um, housing gas chambers and ovens for the cremation of the dead. So what I suggest in this image is that what we're seeing is a kind of tableau of the process of destruction. We have arrival of the train, we have the unloading of the people, we have the beginnings of the separation into those two groups for the selection, and we have um, in the direction of travel the um, end point of this mass murder. So in a single image, we actually see a kind of process of time passing. This is, I think, the intention of the photographer. There's the witting testimony then that we have, but there's also a certain amount of unwitting testimony. He's not interested in the individuals on the platform. But if we look more closely, we we'll start to pick out some of that individuality circled here is a young boy looking directly back apparently at us but of course actually at the photographer who has taken his position up on this train. We don't see the perspective of this young child. We don't see uh, his experience. Presumably he would be lost, bewildered, unsure of what's taking place. Following the instructions of those um, in the striped uniforms that are ushering him and the others on. Behind him, an interaction of someone helping a, a woman with her backpack, her belongings. And we'll see those other packet, those other bundles throughout the photograph. And inside those bundles, of course, we know that they carried the things that they believed would help them in the destination they were moving to. They brought with them pots and pans, they brought with them hairbrushes, uh, change of clothes, potato peelers, toothbrushes, the things which were needed for everyday life. And this, I think, exemplifies for us that process of deception that helps to keep people calm and ordered, not knowing, understanding what was taking place here. Elsewhere in the image, we see on the left a woman and a young boy perhaps linking arms, walking again in that direction of travel into the, into the photo frame, ahead of them a, a woman carrying a small baby, a small child. In the foreground, another interaction. One of those men in striped uniform who had actually been identified as um, prisoner Heinrich, uh, Heinrich Price, talking here with a, a young woman. Now, the instructions of the prisoners on the ramp were simply to direct people 
where they had to go and to stand in their lines. The um, instructions for the um, prisoners in these in these striped uniforms was to direct people um, and to organize this process. They were not allowed, they were not permitted to speak to um, the arrivals in any with any more information than that. But it appears in this image by the attitude of those that, um, that we see here that actually something more is taking place. And we know from testimony that there were times when um, whispered remarks would be, uh, advice would be given by those prisoners um, to the arrivals, perhaps to a, a young mother to pass her child to a grandparent um, or to a teenage um, boy to say that he was a few years older, to say he was 18 or to um, an arrival that they should tell the people at the point of selection that they had a trade, that they had some, uh, they were a craftsman of some kind. Any sort of piece of advice that might help them pass the selection. Perhaps that's what's taking place here. But the key point I wanted to make through this closer analysis of this image is the range of interactions that are going on. To the photographer who is uninterested in those people, they're a faceless mass. We need to work a little bit harder to see the agency of those individuals, to restore some of their humanity somehow. Circled also at the back, you'll see um, sort of in the mid distance is a single story building. And if we move along the train as the photographer did, um, we will reach a point a little further on. My hmm, computer seems to have frozen. There's that same building and here we are at the moment of um, selection. We see again um, SS men in uniform, uh, it would be an SS doctor that performed um, this act of, uh, of selection. A line of men bareheaded, you see they've taken their hats off, awaiting their turn. Now again returning to Sontag's argument that uh, these frozen moments uh, these atoms of time lack explanatory power because they don't show us time passing, they don't show us the interconnectedness of events, uh, I think is you know, again something we need to take seriously. But here I think is another example where we can also somehow see time passing. Look at that image closely and you'll ha gain a sense of just how long it took for the SS doctor to make the decision to send people either into the camp for hard manual work, or the majority of them, the other direction towards the gas chambers. The way that we can see that is if we look at the group at the back here who are awaiting, the, the, they've joined this queue moving towards the crematoria and to their deaths. We see a gap with the next person about to walk to them and it's another small gap between these two gentlemen. And each time we see this gap, we gain a sense, if we think about how long it would take for each person to catch up with those in front of them, a matter of seconds. That, of course, is the amount of time that the SS doctor has spent in this decision of life or death. So again, in a sense, in this still image, we can reveal the passing of time and something profound about the cursory nature of this so-called inspection. The wave of their hand, this choice of life or death. But my question is, how much time do we give these same individuals? When we encounter an image like this, in a book or in a, an exhibition, do we spend longer than a few seconds with them also? You know, in a sense, we can see this sort of image and move quickly on. But don't we owe it to those men standing in this line to spend a little more time with them than the SS doctor did? To think who they were, where they'd come from, what life they'd lived, who they loved, who loved them. We can't answer those questions, of course, just from this image. But we owe it to them, I think, to see them as more than just objects, more than just tools to be used and work to death in the camp or to be sent on, to give some consideration to again who these individuals were, to a wonder that at least. So within our exhibition we don't only rely upon the sources from the Auschwitz album of course, 
source, but we juxtapose these throughout the exhibition with other sources, one of which is a group of photographs selected from some 2,400 which survive today. These are photographs of um, families, of friends, individuals, of loved ones. These are the photographs that people brought with them to Auschwitz amongst their belongings, in their pockets, in their wallets, believing that they were going to this new life, they took photos with them. Most of those photographs would have been destroyed, but a collection of them were somehow preserved in the Canada barracks uh, where the possessions were sorted. We don't know the exact details, there are some different theories about how they survived, but we do know that they were discovered after the war. And this collection has been researched by, among others, um, Storin and Weiss, uh, and have been identified as mostly coming from one of two Polish towns, Bedzin or Sosnowiec. So in a sense, what we see here in this collection are not only individuals, but communities, life lived before. This is the life that was destroyed. So again, it's important when we imagine Auschwitz, that we see beyond the train load of masses of people arriving and being chosen, selected by the SS, the SS who have the great agency in these images. And of course, look beyond the image that we see through the perpetrator's lens and instead challenge that with the lens of the people themselves. So while these were taken, of course, before the war in times of um, joy and love and friendship, in a sense, they become Auschwitz photographs because they're discovered uh, in Auschwitz itself after the war. And here are the images of the murdered themselves or at least of their families. Another way of seeing the perfect, the, um, a view of Auschwitz not through the lens of the perpetrator is this remarkable collection of just four photographs which survive, which were taken by the Zonderkommando themselves. So this is a, from a reel of film um, that was smuggled out of Auschwitz. And from the, the left-hand side here, from inside the gas chambers of Crematoria 5, we're looking out in the summer of 1944, where the ovens are so choked with the bodies of the dead that actually the um, perpetrators have resorted to burning bodies in the open in these mass pits. And those mainly Jewish um, prisoners that were forced to work in the crematoria, ushering people to through the uh, undressing rooms, telling them to, that they would be having a shower, telling them to undress and to go through to the next room, to remember the number on their clothes pegs so they could find their clothes again when they came back. This whole process of deception, the handling of the bodies, the corpses, the burning of the, of the bodies. Um, these were done by um, prisoners in Auschwitz, um, who of course were forced to do this under threat of death themselves. A small group of them, Again, there are different theories as to how, but a small group of them managed to get hold of a camera and take these four images. A photographer, the photographer was a man, Alberto Herrera, a Greek a Jew, who uh, later tried to escape from Auschwitz and was killed, didn't survive this period, but his photographs have done. Here we see images from trembling hands taken hurriedly through this portal. Um, or uh, here, uh, the trees nearby, and in the corner, you can see uh, women being um, made to run naked towards their deaths in the gas chambers. They're being made to undress in the woods. This photograph in the bottom right, um, in a sense, is a failed photograph. Uh, it doesn't, there's nothing which we can really make out here other than the shadowy, blurry image of the trees in the sky. This, of course, is because 
Herrera and those that were helping him were having to do this clandestinely um, at enormous risk. And so these photographs that often are displayed cropped with this black frame missing, so just to kind of zoom in on the um, image itself, they somehow lose a pre the presence of the photographer. So when we display these images, we wanted to show them in their entirety and to show all four, including mm -hmm. this one, which in a sense is a failed image, but I would argue to some extent, perhaps gives us a sense of the chaos of mass murder, even more so than those perfectly composed still images that are the more famous albums from the so-called Dilly Jacob album, the um, Auschwitz album that we saw previously. What we see here revealed is the positionality of the different photographers. So the SS man who can take up his position on the top of a train and take his time and his care has all the time in the world to compose his image. He even intervenes in various images, halts the process, stops people, takes portraits of them. Um, he's a participant in that process. He's in control of his image. Herrera, when he takes these images, of course, is part of the, he's one of the victims and he's part of that chaos. And what he's doing is to try and record for, uh, for us, for the outside world, for posterity, some witness, some image of the process of mass murder. Because in the Auschwitz album, there is certainly no image like this at all. So although we see the process of destruction, we never see um, the heaps of naked bodies that we know from other places such as bergen Belsen. We see nothing of the operation inside the gas chambers. But here we do, here we do see something of that and the only images that we have. Taken in the same period, also in the summer of 1944, while the smoke in Birkenau from the chimneys is belching in um, Birkenau and um, rising from these open pits that we see here in the Zonderkommando photos, during the same period, those SS men and some women who operated uh, the camp, the functionaries of um, the Auschwitz-Birkenau, Auschwitz complex, Auschwitz-Birkenau also, uh, had their moments of rest and recuperation. This is an album which only more, much more recently came to light and uh, is now being donated to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It's known as the Hooker album after the gentleman in the middle here, Karl Hooker, who was the adjutant of the um, commander, the commandant of Auschwitz I, Richard Bayer. Bayer had taken over from uh, Rudolf Huss uh, as the commandant of Auschwitz. Um, he arrives uh, really in um, only in 1944 in the kind of final phase, but the kind of greatest crescendo of Auschwitz as the killing complex period in which Huss actually makes his return also to oversee the murder of the uh, Hungarian Jews. Um, those are the people that we see in the Lily Jacob album. So these are all um, synchronous with each other. These, these are happening at the same time. These are images in a sense of the same place in the same time but from very different kinds of perspectives. Here we see as I say the SS at rest and play. Here, again in Solohuta, this lodge by the river, um, close to the Auschwitz complex. We see SS men gathered singing together uh, as an accordion player seems to sway to the music. And rate some 70 or so uh, SS men from Auschwitz. In the front again, we see Karl Hooker, Next to him here, Otto Moll. Moll was uh, in charge of the gas chambers and crematoria in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Alongside them, we see uh, Rudolf Hurst, the original commandant of Auschwitz, who's come back to oversee the murder of the Hungarian Jews. Next to him, Richard Bayer, the new 
uh, commandant of Auschwitz. A little further back here, uh, Kramer, the uh, Joseph Kramer, who's now the commandant of Auschwitz-Birkenau, the death camp of Auschwitz. A little further on, Joseph Mengele, the infamous SS doctor at Auschwitz. Here they are singing songs together and enjoying themselves. When this photograph emerged, the juxtaposition between this image and the image that we knew of Auschwitz from the Lily Jacob album was so striking, of course. It seems like, how is this possible to exist? These are, appear to be kind of two worlds, two separate worlds. But what we want to argue in the Seeing Auschwitz exhibition is that these two images are, of course, very entwined. Rather than being two separate worlds, it is actually um, the function of Auschwitz to create this SS deal. What they're doing in Auschwitz, in Birkenau, is emptying Europe of its Jews. This is a world in Solohutter without Jews, without um, the so-called Untermensch of Europe, those who were despised by the Nazis. And it's the place such as Solohutter, with its relaxation, sunbathing on the deck, which perhaps also makes their work in Auschwitz possible and gives it meaning. So these places, again, going back to Sontag, and this needs to connect different images of the same place over time to see how things function. If we stop seeing it just within the image itself and rather kind of connect these things, a different kind of meaning emerges for us. One other set of photographs which we use in the exhibition come from, again, the same place and same time. This is the summer of 1944. This is an aerial photograph taken by um, the RAF, a reconnaissance plane of the, of the British Air Force. And uh, flying over um, this region, uh, photographing to look for places to uh, strike, of course, uh, military targets. And indeed, the following month, the US Air Force, as we see here, do drop bombs over the Auschwitz complex. We see them falling down over, apparently over Birkenau, and in the, uh, just here, um, crematoria two and three that we saw in those first images, the photograph from the train, we saw those chimneys in the distance, crematorias four and five, this is where those um, photographs from inside the crematory by the Zonder Commando were taken. So we may be forgiven for thinking that this becomes a target of uh, the Allies. But actually, when we take into account the speed and direction of the plane and the distance that these bombs will travel, they're actually not aimed at Birkenau at all, but a different part of Auschwitz, Auschwitz III Monowitz, which was a huge industrial complex owned by IG Farben, the world's second largest corporation, a place which was making uh, synthetic oil, synthetic rubber for the German war effort. That becomes a military target. Birkenau never does, despite the fact that by this period, the British and the Americans did have good intelligence, good knowledge of uh, the events that were taking place there. What does that mean for us today? So what we want to do through this exhibition and what I'm trying to do through this talk is to think about how different sources of images, of visual images of Auschwitz can reveal radically different meanings. This is another photograph from the Lily Jacob album, that first album that we looked at together, the so-called Auschwitz album. Here we see some of the barracks of Canada. This is the region of the camp of the complex where the possessions of the dead were being sorted and we see women prisoners here sorting through the shoes of them of the murdered victims of Auschwitz. Vast piles of shoes. Now the intention of the photographer again is again to show something of the efficiency of Auschwitz and its purpose because one of the things that um, Auschwitz and the Holocaust was doing, of course, was looting from its victims and a great source of um, 
of money was was made through the murder of the people, through their dispos dispossession, through the confiscation of their goods. This is really what's been shown in this image, that the SS are performing a good job in the eyes of their masters. But if we look in the background here, you'll notice some clouds of smoke. These I want to suggest is the same smoke which is drifting from those open pits not far, in this case from seen through the doors of Crematoria 5, these images of the Zonda Commando. We can connect these images through these motifs and in that aerial photograph by the RAF, Again, just at that point of crematorias four and five, this plume of smoke rising from the ground. What we see in this image, of course, is the distance, the physical distance of the plane from the, the land. But this is also somehow um, a symbol, I think, for the distance in thinking of the allies from these events as they unfolded on the ground. So that plume of smoke is not analyzed, it's not registered in the same way that we would do to get today. And nearby, while the smoke is rising from Birkenau, the SS and the uh, women helpers in the camp are eating their blueberries in Solofita. How we frame these things, how we place these together, can maybe help us think not only about the image that the perpetrator give us, but somehow something of their inner life through that hooker album. And we restore something of the agency of the victims themselves by showing the Zonda Commando photographs and raise questions of the outside world, which did have knowledge of these events and chose not to make the bombing of Auschwitz or indeed the rescue of Jews a major war aim. Thank you. I um, hope we'll be able to engage in some uh, discussion now and here if you want to follow this up um, later on outside of this uh, event you can reach me at Twitter at p underscore Sammons or email me. Any of you who are working in venues are interested in knowing more about the exhibition itself, um, Seeing Auschwitz, or interested in hosting the exhibition, the news of educational resources that will emerge from that exhibition and based on some of the ideas in this talk, you can contact Museadia who produced this exhibition at the email director at museadia.net. Okay, thank you so much for your attention. Um, looking forward to the discussion. <laughs> and thank you, Paul. And like I said, um, we will take a few minutes if someone wants to leave discussion they can leave as we continue talking but if there is anyone who wants to stay for a more interactive open mic uh, discussion we can do that too um, there were a few questions more general questions uh, not specifically about what you were talking about but there is something that um, caught my eye from uh, Hank Greenspan and uh, he brought a quote from uh, Agi Rubin uh, and this is uh, the quote, photos are the outsider's way of remembering Auschwitz, but they are not ours. From the inside, we remember smells, the stench of the camp, the odor of unwashed flesh, the odor of burning flesh and sounds, screaming, beating, pleading, the whistle of a whip or a train and the feeling of having no feeling, seeing if it was done at all, was done mostly through averted, and I can't see it because there's something covering it for a sec. Ugh, I am just learning how to use Zoom. <laughs> but I have to say that um, this uh, testimony uh, really reminds me the, the way you ask us to look beyond the perpetrator and to look at the people, to give them agency, to return agency to the to the victim um i also think how sterile the photographs really are no matter how much we try to bring humanity to them uh what hank greenspan is saying and what uh Aghi rubin is saying is that actually they really do freeze a moment 
that isn't the reality of what they were facing. So if you could maybe deal with that kind of uh, conflict between the perpetrator's gaze, our gaze, and maybe the victim's uh, inner experience as he's being photographed and represented through photography. It's an, it's an extraordinary powerful quote, isn't it? And, it is. um, yeah. and, and certainly reaches, I think what, what we're trying to say through the exhibition and, and I'm trying to reach in this talk is, is partly that, the, the limitations of these images, that these sorts of photographs dominate our imagination, but they are insufficient. And it's through, a, I think, a more critical reading of them that we can reach some of these kind of deeper meanings. Um, they are only atoms of time. Yeah. They do not, uh, in any sense, give us a, a full picture or a true picture. And indeed, um, Primo Levi, of course, also speaks about um, the true witnesses did not survive the Holocaust. He, as a survivor himself, talks about the limitations of being unable to speak about what really happened at the last. You know, when you enter, when the, uh, when the victims entered the gas chambers, there is no memory of that. There is no record of it, of course. It's a black hole of Auschwitz. So in so many ways, and what we need to do, of course, is to supplement this visual imagery, which is so strong, and overcome it to some extent through the kinds of testimonies that Hankler just quoted for us and many others, and also through the artifacts that remain, through visiting the place, through the archaeology. Um, we're always seeking, of course, a kind of deeper understanding. No single source is is able to convey something which is so far beyond our experience. But hopefully a more critical reading can help. Um, there is another question. Um, um, Rachel Perry was asking about the purpose of the Solohute album. You said that it would be more of a congratulatory uh, celebration. Is that your understanding of the, the album? I think um, the Solohute album or the, the Hooker album, uh, it seems that this is very much a personal record of Carl Hooker himself. He appears on almost on every page. Um, it seems that this is a, a man who was brought from Majdanek um, because of his intimate knowledge and understanding of the killing process there to assist the new commandant of Auschwitz, Richard Bayer, who, who hadn't had that kind of experience. And it, it, may, it may be that um, somehow the other album, the Lily Jacob album, or the, the more well-known Auschwitz album, perhaps was something which was put together to um, help explain to the new commandant, or could have at least had that function, how the um, place pro functioned and how, how the process unfolded. Um, the Solohuta album, yeah, it seems to be something which is, uh, I guess what it reveals to us is that you don't, you don't make an album of images or of events that you're ashamed of, right? This is something which clearly he was totally at ease with. And I think we can see that in the relaxation and the, the expressions of the others, for instance, those singing in that, in that group. Um, and I think what it does is to uh, give the light of that, uh, to, to reveal to us that that myth that people were forced to do these things is just yeah. not true. Yeah. Um, there is another question, uh, uh, and maybe that it also connects us to the exhibition itself. Um, what do you think the value of drawings are? Uh, he gives a few examples like Olaire. Um, some of them were used as evidence in Nazi trials. Were they used in, uh, as evidence? Uh, maybe a com not merely a comparison, but maybe a, a look. In the exhibition, seeing Auschwitz, um, among the artifacts, I imagine there's also uh, drawings that were made during, maybe after. Maybe you can uh, elaborate a little bit about the place of drawings and artwork. Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have, um, we do have, we draw quite heavily upon Olaire, for instance. I mean, we, this is perhaps yeah. the only visual record we really have of the functioning, you know, inside um, the gas chambers, the crematoria. And in the absence of photographic evidence, um, Olaire's drawings are immensely important, I think. Um, in terms of understanding what went on as a documentary record. So although um, somehow photographs are given a higher status as evidentiary, mm -hmm. uh, evidentiary value, I think you know, the, we, we certainly do not underestimate the power and the importance of the, of the 
visual image drawn by those that were there. This is another form of witnessing. Um, there are also those uh, photographs, sorry, those uh, drawings that were concealed in Auschwitz um, in Birkenau, which uh, show arrival and selection. And we've used those, for instance, in Madrid to contrast with the um, Auschwitz album and to give a kind of different kind of perspective on the same events unfolding. Uh, and there you do see uh, not the pitiless lens of the perpetrator, but the very empathetic um, and urgent uh, line drawn by uh, one of the victims themselves. Mm, I also, when I think of Olaire, I also, also think a little bit about what uh, Agi Rubin was saying, that his pictures really gave you a sense of, you know, this, this, the, the smells, the, the feelings. It comes out in drawings maybe more than a frozen atom in time. Interesting, very interesting uh, look. Um, I do want to take a moment to uh, uh, kind of take a stop for those who want to leave and before they leave because people are already starting to leave the zoom room just to once again say thank you to uh paul for once again uh enlightening us and i hope i hope that we get a chance to see the exhibition bring the exhibition to israel it meanwhile it's all virtual um i also want to thank the Dorfman foundation for making this lecture series possible and I want to thank all our participants that were here for their patience, of course, and also for their questions and for their interest. And um, to remind everyone that you're invited to come to our next lecture on August 30th, Sunday, August 30th, uh, with Elizabeth uh, Reinecki, who's going to give a talk, an, an incredible talk about what it is to be a great grandchild in search of art, apropos art. Uh, and I think it'll be an amazing uh, lecture as well, or talk. So uh, what we're doing meanwhile is setting up a link. So if someone before they leave wants to hear theirs, thank you on. You can see the link to the uh, registration and you can take it from here. And like I said, if you don't have time and you wanna leave, uh, we'll be sending out an email uh, as well. So I want to thank everyone again. And I see that we still have about 160 people. Uh, Ron is going to open the mic and we're going to do an open mic session. So those who want to stay, please stay. The more the merrier, right? Okay, so we're off. <laughs> yeah, so I have a question. Uh, Paul, I'd like to. Okay, ask can you hear me? Wait. One moment. Let me um, just say one thing. Let uh, Paul, do you want to start by saying something? I don't know why you're on there. Why are you muted? I don't know why. Okay, do you want to start by saying something or? or uh, I've said I've said quite <laughs> a lot, as often happens. Yes, you and, have. Um, uh, so I'm people are starting to. to I don't want to talk so. To I'd love to hear other people's thoughts and views, and uh, maybe we can just begin a yes. conversation. Yes, so I think we, yes, I think, Morris, is that you, right? It yes. says administrator, right? Yes. So I think we'll start with Morris, because you were with us last week as well, and it was really hard to stay on mute, so we're giving you the yes, first Probably. Letter. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, as you probably remember <clears throat> from the last meeting, I'm, my name is Maury Chandler, I'm a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto, and I made it out after two years I escaped, but my total family was taken to the Umschlagplatz in Warsaw and sent to Treblinka, and there was, we, I visited Treblinka a few years back, and there's all you see is uh, giant boulders. There was nothing left. I, so I was wondering, I know from what I heard that there was a handful of people in Treblinka that survived. And I was wondering if there are any at all photographs even taken by the Germans. And I was just, it's a chance. I have nothing. It was totally a total wipeout of my total family. So if there's a miracle somebody took a picture i would like to know 
So um, thank you for the, the question and for sharing a very personal um, part of your own story. Um, I, I take groups to Poland and, oh, I'm sorry, are we still here? Okay. Um, I take yeah. to Poland every year, uh, including to Warsaw and to the Umschlagplatz and from there out to Treblinka. Um, we, there are photographs um, that, that are still extant, uh, a small number, nothing like the, um, those of the Auschwitz album. We don't have any record, any visual record of arrival and selection um, at any of the other camps. Indeed in Treblinka there was virtually no selection of course, almost everyone who arrived there was sent straight to their death. But there are some photographs by the um, SS, mm -hmm. um, some you know, they're horrific in a, in a different sense. So you have photographs of the kind of camp zoo, you have mm -hmm. and the bakery. photographs of the bakery, right. Um, you have uh, some photographs of the uh, of the diggers that were used to exhume um, the dead as well when the, when they were um, cremated after. Um, so there are a very small number of, uh, of photographs. Um, if if you if Medine is able to uh, give me your email address, I can send you a link to some of those um, images. Absolutely, um, there is also well. a, sorry, there is also a photograph um, from outside the camp. Of, smoke rising there and, and, and this is a witness partly to the, to, to the um, rebellion, the revolt in Treblinka. Um, so there are no, that, that I'm aware of, there are no um, clandestine photographs in the same way as under commando and there are no photographs like the Auschwitz album, but there are some photographs, a very small number of Treblinka. Great, so I'll make that connection. Thank you. And I have your uh, email, I have it here, and I also have it at, on my list. So, okay, Morris, that will definitely be taken care of. Thank you. Okay. Can I say something, if it's of any interest? When I escaped the Warsaw Ghetto, and I changed my name to a young Catholic a boy, my first job was five miles from Treblinka. And the Polish people were pointing to the smoke from the furnaces in Treblinka. I had no idea what they were talking about, but they said that the Jews are going out through the chimneys. And I, this is, was a conversation, a daily conversation. Mm. And so just for whatever it's worth. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there someone else? Yes, I see that. Rochelle? Yes? One second. We will unmute you. I don't think I can unmute. One. Ah, okay. Hi. 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 Thank you so much. That was very, very illuminative. My question has to do with something that you uh, touched upon only sort of on the margin when you uh, showed the photographs of uh, that, that were found in among the victims uh, belongings of their life before the Holocaust. Um, and I, um, it, it, my sense is, um, my, my parents, I, I'm from Poland originally, my parents were Holocaust survivors. One of the things that I'm very interested, in, especially now in the United States, is Holocaust education. I'm not an educator myself, but I think it's an extremely important topic. And one of the things that concerns me about Holocaust education in general, that it focuses on Jews at a time that were, they were so victimized that it's very hard to empathize. You know, but it's talking about so the reason that that captured my attention that I think it would be very important that context to show the life, the world that was lost. Sorry, I get emotional. Hmm. And I want to know 
of uh, good uh, resources, uh, whether are photographs, etc., of the kind that you showed, but in, in greater numbers, whether any, you know of anybody planning any exhibits in that regard and so on. So um, I think today most um, Holocaust exhibitions uh, do a good job in terms of beginning, or very often beginning with the life before. Uh, I think, as you say, it's so important that we understand these um, people do not arrive on the historical stage to be murdered. They have lives before, they have a rich life, rich culture, uh, rich communities. Um, and one of the one of the areas that we need to um, help young people to understand is the enormous loss um, through the void of that's been created by that genocide. So the only way really to do that, the only way to understand something of the magnitude of, of the Holocaust or of, indeed of any genocide at all, is to understand what was there before and what was destroyed. Um, most, as I say, museums, most institutions have created such uh, spaces within their exhibitions and also uh, in their educational resources as well. So certainly uh, all the major institutions um, would have that kind of resource. It's hard to recommend a single one, right? I mean, there are, there are many. Mm -hmm. um, and I think many now also do a good job in terms of during the process itself, showing, trying to show the agency of the victims in terms of the resistance and the resilience of those people and their agency. Again, that they were not passive victims. And again, that's what we, of course, tried to show in that small exhibition, seeing Auschwitz, even through those small number of photographs, even in those photographs that are taken by the SS to look beyond the SS gaze and at that agency. And certainly it's something that we do throughout our much larger exhibition, um, Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if, again, if you want to email me, I could, I could send you all sorts of links to many different resources, but uh, I'm sure, for instance, the Ghetto Fighters House, I'm certain has educational material on these themes. As well. Certainly Yad Vashem does, the Imperial, Imperial War Museum, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, you know, I think it's importantly been a, a, an area which uh, actually institutions have been good at in recent years. Thank you. Uh, by the way, if I'm thinking about photography, one of the things that we have, at our, we have a children's museum, Rochelle, called Yad Le Yeled, the Children's Memorial, and we use some of the photographs that you showed uh, tonight. And there, uh, there are pictures that we use from that album, as well as other pictures from the Warsaw uh, Ghetto as well. And what we see for every age that we use pictures that don't show the atrocity and yet they still have an effect on our visitors. So I think that what Paul was talking about, you can show these pictures, you, you can still empathize, but you don't have to see the atrocities in order to reach that empathy. And I think that's a really important point. Of course, if you're doing research and you have to look at the most atrocious of uh, documentation, you go there. But as an educator, we saw that really you don't have to go that far in order to make an impact. And I think tonight was an example of that, that you can definitely have a critical eye without having to go so far into the atrocities. Yes, I see Nora, right? Um, yes. And I see Tzvi as well. So I'll start with Nora. Nora is unmuted. Yes, Nora. Shalom. Okay. Shalom Nikulam. Um, first of all, thank you, Paul, for your lecture. Um, I work in the Ghetto Fighters House for 20 years. And um, as an educator, um, plus I'm, I'm an educator plus a photographer. Um, and I tried uh, when I was in Poland, only twice we were, we, I was in Poland. It was enough for me twice to be in Poland. And only one time to be in, um, in Auschwitz. And I took lots of uh, pictures when I knew 
in my mind were all the pictures you show. And I tried to, to think about the photographer. What was in his mind? Uh, he was sent there to photograph. He was, um, okay. But um, I tried to, to uh, find out, especially in Auschwitz, not only in Auschwitz, but especially in Auschwitz, um, um, that photographs, um, the memory and the oblivion. Um, the people are not there. The smells are not there. The shouts are not there. Only the buildings and the signs and the people going around. And it was fascinating for me to mm -hmm. photograph there. Um, I just want to, to make um, a little um, um, uh, an exhibition of my works are now in the Ghetto Fighters house um, when um, and about this, about memory and, um, and oblivion. Um, Auschwitz is an amazing place is a frightened place and I think I, I, I think that um, 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 when you see I wanted to ask you Paul when you see all that photographs what do you think about the photographer because you talk about um, that boy and that woman and that soldier and that the photographer so if we, we're speaking now about the um, the Auschwitz album, right? The one I started yeah. with. The, yeah. Uh, so we don't know for certain who the photographer was, but most likely it's either uh, Bernard Walter or his deputy um, Ernst Hoffmann, um, because they were the, uh, the head and the deputy of the photographic unit in Auschwitz. And uh, their main purpose was the identification photographs of the registration of prisoners. Um, but they also documented the construction of different aspects of Auschwitz. There are other albums. Um, there is also, uh, they were also involved um, in the process of uh, the human experimentation by uh, the SS doctors there and took photographs there. And they, there is witness testimony, for instance, from Wilhelm Brass, a, a Polish, young Polish photographer who was a prisoner in Auschwitz and made to work in the same department. Um, and he speaks to the photographers them, themselves, and they're not in any sense neutral, right? They're not, uh, they're not passive observers. Rather, from their testimony, from his testimony, and also from SS man Perry Broad, he also speaks about how um, when someone had thrown themselves against the electric wire and committed suicide mm -hmm. um, that the photographers would race there to, to get photographs from each angle. There's a rather macabre aspect to their work, um, possibly a, you could speculate a kind of pleasure that they take in it as well. Um, so how do I see them? I see them absolutely as perpetrators, as part of the process and, and um, not, as I say, recording this for our benefit in any sense, but either for their own or for those of their SS masters. Um, so I see them absolutely as part of the criminal process, um, not in any sense to be uh, absolved of blame. It's so interesting. I, I wonder if uh, being also a photographer, that photographer's eye or the camera physically allows me to distance myself and say, well, I'm not really the perpetrator. I'm just uh, and we see that in other occasions when you're watching the news and you can see someone, there was a terrible story of a flood and the photographers from the news were just filming so we would see what was happening, but no one went to save anyone. So mm -hmm. it's interesting, this type of perpetrator is almost like a passive aggressive type of, uh, I'm not really touching them, but I'm only documenting it. So And, and there's absolutely, there's a, 
again, this is this is clearly a you know a possible interpretation of their work. But then I look at some of the images which um, they record in and document in that album. Uh, we tend in our exhibitions to show images such as that of uh, Israel and Zelig Jacob because they are um, images of children that our visitors can very easily and readily identify with. Um, there are also photographs though of, for instance, uh, a gentleman um, who, disabled gentleman, uh, it appears he, you know, he had uh, dwarfism I think, um, but is, is, is sit, sat in this cane chair um, and totally objectified by the photographer. Again, it's a very aggressive, very objectifying kind of act. Presumably he's been chosen because he stands out somehow and he's become an object of interest. Again, there's no empathy, no sympathy, no compassion. Again, it's a very, in my view, a very pitiless lens, the way that this is done. Uh, so I, again, I see them absolutely as perpetrators, not bystanders or observers. Bystanders, absolutely. Um, Svi, Thank you. your microphone is open. Yes. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, good evening. My name is Svi Herschel. I'm a child survivor and I lost my entire family as well from mother's side as my father's side and the majority were murdered in Sovidor. I visit the extermination camps uh, in Poland twice. I'm also Holocaust lecturer and I lecture in Yad Vashem in three languages. Universities in, uh, uh, in Germany, I speak also German. And over the years, I found that actually with all the good things what we are doing, uh, talking about the Holocaust, showing pictures, uh, movies, it's not sufficient. We have to convey a message and in almost 99% of the exhibitions there is no conveying of a message and in all my talks, in all my lectures, by the end I make a closure and I give something to think about it because it, it, it really, it is a fantastic uh, that, uh, uh, Paul, that you, you lecture, you give all the details, etc., etc. But in principle, it's not sufficient. It's not negative, but it's not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And to give you an example, I was two months in Germany. I traveled three times up and down. And I had an audience of over 4,000 people, students, youngsters, uh, adults. I give lectures in the uh, Polizei, uh, uh, the Polizei Hochschule, the Polizei Academy, and I convey a message. Not only that I talk about discrimination, and I come with all kinds of stories and photographs out of, my, of the archive of my father's, my father's archive, but it's not sufficient. And anyone who's interested in the Holocaust, I advise to go and visit one of the camps of all the camps. Otherwise, you don't have an ID. A photograph is static. But the moment you are standing in, in Auschwitz or in Birkenau, then it's so overwhelming. It, it, it goes to your soul. And that's what I, especially for Jewish people, go there and see for yourself. Thank you, and, and convey a message. Thank you, Svi. I, I mean, I, I can't agree with you more about the importance of visiting authentic sites. Um, many places throughout Europe, uh, Auschwitz can be found not only within the perimeter of the former camp, of course, but in all the towns and cities where people were deported from and their absence today. So when we visit, when I visit visit Europe with um, groups. We're looking for Auschwitz and Treblinka and Sobibor in the former homes and places uh, where people lived also. And I think in the sense of a message that, at least in the work that I do, part of that is to try and convey that sense of loss and that void, but also hopefully to help young people and educators reach a better understanding, a fuller understanding of how and why this was possible, um, what the warning signs are, um, how this was able to take place not very long ago, not very far from, from where many of us live today. Um, and the 
the fragility of our uh, so-called civilization. Right? The, 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 this mass violence not only was perpetrated during the years of the Nazi era, but of course there's been mass violence before and there's continuing mass violence in the world today. So at the end of our Seeing Auschwitz exhibition, which you know, I touched on today, but I didn't show everything which is in there, we actually end with um, a statement and, and bearing in mind that this was first shown in the United Nations and in UNESCO. Uh, we make the point at the end that with all the continuing atrocities in the world today, if we don't do a better job at understanding how this is possible and a better job at intervening and trying to prevent and strengthen genocide prevention, then it's perhaps um, the case that we haven't really seen Auschwitz at all. Uh, so in that sense, we, we have a, a message, if you like, but we also try to leave some of that open, as I'm sure you do as well, to those that you work with, because we want them to come to their own meanings and their own conclusions, uh, which are often more profound than at least the and I feel that I can offer. But I, I, you know, I can't agree with you more about the importance of that. Thank you. I have another thing to add. Uh, at the moment, the, um, unfortunately, the antisemitism is sky high. And I spoke to students and youngsters, Jewish youngsters and students. They are more or less lost with their identity. You know, I live here in Israel, my grandchildren are born here, but the rest of the world, the Jewish students, the youth, they, are, they don't know their identity anymore. They don't know where to look. They look over their shoulder. And I, I had Zoom sessions with students, Jewish students from Turkey, from Istanbul. And I encourage them not to lose your identity. Don't shuffle it under the rock because that's our next generation. In principle, that's more important than all the other people to educate. In first, it's our people. And then we have to, to, to convey the message to the rest of the world. And we mustn't forget that, otherwise we are lost. Hey, thank you so much. First of all, also being able to hear from a survivor, that perspective is so important to us and we are lucky enough to still have that ability to, to listen to survivors and have your insight, which is so important to all of us. I absolutely agree with you. How do we hold on to an identity and what is an identity, especially when you live all around the world and you want to have multiple identities. So that's definitely something that we all have to think about. Thank you so much. Um, Steven Goelik, yes, um, I'm going to unmute you. I know that you were asking to talk. I, there, I, uh, I tried. <laughs> I'm trying to unmute. Lauren, I, I guess I don't have the power to unmute. There, okay. I'm, I think I'm unmuted. Now you're unmuted. <laughs> <clears throat> this was very uh, profound for me in a, a very unexpected way. Um, I came to Holocaust studies and been at the, in residence at the museum in, in DC and so on. But I came from the discipline of criminology. And um, um, criminology has a, there are a group of people who are his, so-called historical criminologists. Um, and it involves a, a, a sort of a different, but not completely different sort of way at seeing these events. Anyway, it gets to the, the visual image. I see that I've been doing something over a career in which most, much of my time was spent looking at horrible images, not just from Holocaust, but from my field um, um, in criminology, aside from the Holocaust, I, I, I work on mass catastrophic violence. I look at photos of the aftermath of current, all these kinds of things. But what I realized from listening to you is that there is this unconscious, very quick, self-protective thing that I have done. When I'm gazing at a photograph that to protect myself, 
Uh, and when you pointed out those two little faces in the crowd, I realized that with everything I've looked at, I, I think more often than not, and often without thinking about it, I've sort of used a self-protective where I, I, I didn't really want to see uh, some people's eyes, especially if they might have been looking at the camera because then they were looking at me. And this even goes with photos of fatalities after criminal incidents that I have been, I've worked with, worked on. Uh, and it, I, I've come to see, it, it, there, it's a much, uh, you're asking us to take a much deeper look uh, at images that, that gives, and, and to avoid even unconscious slight protective things that allow us to deny the humanity of the things, the people that we're looking at. And, you know, it may be, I'll just last thing, maybe it hasn't been that, well, I'm, they, it's always my, from my students over the years, Steve, how do you have the stomach to look at all of this stuff? And, um, and I often say, well, I, I, something about clinical distance and stuff. But what I see now, I'm, it's, I'm shaken a little bit, is that for the whole career, um, I have been avoiding the humanity of the people I've looked at and not looking people in the eyes. And that includes bodies of people who are no longer alive. Um, very powerful insight to realize that at the end of, at, when, after I just retired, to, <laughs> to now understand the, the challenges of really looking at, it, at an image and having a full confrontation. A full confrontation. Um, we're going to send the chat to Paul because you did write about that in the chat and it was very personal. I think that uh, you'll be interested and everyone can read as well, some of the um, experiences that you were having as we, as Paul was giving his talk. So very interesting. Um, thank you so much for sharing, Stephen. And it's never too late. So you can always teach those that come after you. Um, okay, so we're going to, is it Leila? You can unmute yourself. Oh, it's actually Caroline, but on someone else's iPad. Oh, thank okay. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Long time no see. Thank you. Hi, Caroline. Nice to see you. Caroline. Yeah, so, always, yeah, sorry. Always lovely to hear you. Yeah, it just made me think, you know, while we've had time, obviously you were limited what you could show us. So, and I haven't seen your away exhibition, obviously. So how do you deal with liberation? Because it made me think now when we look at liberation photos, they're taken through mm -hmm. the eyes of the liberators. Obviously in DP camps, people had more time and I assume photography and art happened. But just briefly, can you tell us a little bit how you would deal with liberation then and students? So in the, the small Seeing Auschwitz exhibition, as I mentioned, there's two exhibitions, one very large with some um, hundreds of, 700 or so original artifacts and 400 photographs, testimonies. That's the large exhibition which we had first in Madrid and is currently in uh, New York City. Um, then there's the small exhibition Seeing Auschwitz, which is the one I was sort of drawing on today, which is this photographic exhibition. Uh, that the same team I was fortunate enough to work on, Robert Yandon Pelt and Miriam Greenbaum as well, and uh, uh, Louis Ferrero produced these exhibitions. Um, so in the Seeing Auschwitz exhibition, we actually end with uh, some photographs from uh, Russian photographers at Liberation, or the, uh, the a burning barrack, um, for example in uh, Auschwitz because one of the things we wanted to show there was the attempted destruction of the evidence. You know, as the uh, SS fled Auschwitz, of course, they tried to destroy as much as they could. Um, and so this burning barrack in Auschwitz was sort of symbolic of that, but we also showed a photograph from inside Canada with some forensic uh, investigators uh, examining the human hair. Um, so it was our opening, if you like, to the um, the witnessing after the fact and the criminal investigations that went on. And that led us to that point I mentioned before about um, the need to strengthen 
efforts in the world at um, genocide prevention. So that's how we kind of integrated that view within that exhibition. Uh, in the large exhibition in the Artifact Driven One, we have some similar elements, but also uh, not only photographs, but um, artifacts from uh, that period as well. And so we're able to go into that kind of depth there. And of course, in that exhibition, also looking at the aftermath in terms of how people try to reconstruct their lives after the Holocaust. And uh, our exhibition there ends um, with the last note given to survivors telling their uh, reflections on what this means. Um, but also a, a film, um, it was mentioned before about the need to uh, show pre-war life. Uh, we actually have a film at the very end of the exhibition which does that. And that was a very conscious decision because we wanted to show people what was lost as they left the exhibition and to remind them that those that they had seen reduced to uh, corpses and to um, uh, tortured prisoners, of course, did have a life before and had that agency. So we kind of ended with that. Moving. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Caroline. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, by the way, I'm thinking of the uh, exhibition at Bergen Belsen. I've been twice to the documentary center. I can't go into the section that they put on uh, the liberation. They have this, uh, it's, it's separated from the rest of the exhibition. It's behind a black curtain. For some reason, I just, I've tried three times. So there's something that you talk about the liberation. You have to be very careful how you approach like you said, the corpses and the lives before, so that people can also uh, look at that as well. It's a curator's uh, hardest uh, <laughs> position, I think, that, that one point between life and death, survival and, and not surviving. Um, okay, I, if there's anybody else who'd like to ask a question or make a comment, this is the last moment. Okay, we have, well, it says Vicky and Harry. So I imagine it's Harriet. You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Nope, you're still muted. As now. Great. All right. I want to thank Paul for his comments uh, with regard to photographs. It was very interesting. Uh, I have actually two short questions, but it's from a vantage point. I, I was a public school teacher in the classroom uh, teaching about Holocaust and genocide going back to the 1970s uh, when there really was very little material. So we had to create our own material dealing with this subject. We now have, 40 plus years later, a surplus of materials for the, for the public school teacher to deal with these subjects. So the question has changed dramatically over two generations. Now, the question becomes, with limited time and all of the demands on a public school teacher uh, in the classroom who may have a legitimate interest in dealing with this subject, the question becomes tactically, what is the very best material I can use in a short amount of time to, to make this subject come alive? So, and it's with another vantage point, which was uh, my father was in Auschwitz. Uh, he, he was the only survivor of his family. Uh, Members of his family died either by gas or on the wire. Uh, I heard those stories. So I, I come from that whole background. But the, bo the bottom line is two questions. First is an easy one, which is, would you use a portion of a film that was made in 2018, excerpts called The Photographer of Mauthausen in the classroom? And I don't mean the entire film, but portions. The second is a more deep question, which is, if I have limited time, and I want to deal in part, obviously, with photographs as part of what I do. And I have to choose the very most important photo, and this is hard because there are choices made here, the very best photographs that I can use, let's say five of them, that come out of the camp experience. And I, and I say those are the ones for which I want to make the most important point that I'm trying to make in the classroom. It would be interesting to have Paul, it doesn't have to be on the spot, say, okay, these are the five materials that if I had to tell a public school teacher, secondary level, these are the, these are the ones I choose. Because you know what? Teachers are doing this. They can't show 400 pictures. That's not realistic. 
They can't do all sorts of things. They've got limited time. I, I'm a work, I do workshops. I'm always doing this in terms of tactically, what do we do in the classroom if we have a limited amount of time? But I want to thank you again for what you're doing and what you continue to do. But I'd be curious as to your answer to both of those questions. <laughs> So, so thank you very much for those those kind comments and um, I agree with you the challenge of time is uh, is enormous it's a it's a real the research which I've been involved in at UCL and, and research that others have done show this time and again that teachers really struggle to make those kinds of choices um, so I think there are I mean one element in terms of which photographs uh, we're working, um, team at Musealia, uh, myself, to develop new school education resources which will draw from both the Seeing Auschwitz exhibition and the uh, larger artifact drift. Um, so in terms of photographs, we'll have things available on our website in the next six weeks, two months or so. Uh, so I'd urge you to take a look at that and it will draw very heavily on the sorts of things I've been speaking about today. Uh, but I think in terms of which decision you an individual teacher would take is needs to be underpinned by several elements one is their rationale for why they're teaching about the holocaust what their aims are then to have a very clear understanding of the needs of their students of course and what's age appropriate and what will provoke the right kinds of questions for them to think about um, a sense of what their understanding of progression in learning is. What do young people need in order to access deeper thinking, deeper understanding on those issues? And how will different, to think about the implotment of different resources that can kind of take them to those areas. So, uh, you know, I hope that's not ducking the question because it's not giving a specific resource, um, but I'm hesitant to do that because there is so much good uh, material out there. And, you know, I think it does depend very much on that teachers aims and on their students needs but as I say I mean there is there is work that we're developing in our team I'm developing at the moment which I hope will be useful but I wouldn't in any sense suggest that anything for instance that I've done or any one other person has done is a kind of one size fits all you know I think it does depend on your on your rationale and on your students needs but I'm happy to um, go into it in more depth with you on you know by email or uh, you know, continue the conversation because I realize I am to some extent ducking it. <laughs> okay, well, I think that we need to uh, tie everything up. I, I could stay a little longer. It's only, what, almost 11 o'clock here, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but I do think that it's time for us to say thank you once again to Paul Sammons for uh, intriguing talk and for the after talk and for the open mic and thank you for asking your questions and for the survivors for sharing their insight this is so valuable and we really are the last generation to appreciate and to be able to be a part to experience that personal um, and again i remind everyone that's still with us that we do have another lecture in two weeks and you're all invited to come to Elizabeth Renecki's uh, incredible personal story and journey to find her great-grandfather's uh, artworks throughout Europe. Um, until then, uh, I want to say good afternoon, good night, good morning. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your wisdom and uh, goodbye to everyone. Thank you again for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you and thank you all for your your questions, your comments. I hope we carry on the conversation. Uh, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, I like the open mic. <laughs> Thank you. It's, a, it's interesting to do it, right? I mean, on, online with so many people as well. I hope. So many people, it's true.
uh, yeah. thank you again. No, the worst, I think, was... It was fantastic. I thank you very, very much. Thank you, Sveen. Thank you for your, your comments before. I, I really appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Do you, do, you know, do you know about Morris Chandler and his story? I just discovered no. last week he was um, in uh, Glenn Kurtz's movie, Three Minutes in Poland. He's yeah. the little boy that wow. uh, his granddaughter discovers in the film and they make a connection and that's how he finds out about the rest <laughs> of the people <laughs> in the city. So, yeah. Amazing. I know I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Have a pleasant evening. Until Thank next you. time. I know for us it's late. <laughs> well, it was very interesting for me as a, a Russian speaking user because I did translation about Wilhelm Brasse from ah. Hebrew into Russian uh -huh. uh, and did an article about him uh, in the Russian speaking newspaper based wow. in Israel. It was uh, very interesting for me as uh, as historian, my education is historian, but my English is very poor. I, I lost my English when I began to study Hebrew. But just now, I I, I speak with you, and uh, and just now I translate from Hebrew into Russian the book about the um, rebellion in Treblinka of uh, uh, Semek uh, Willenberg. Wow. Oh, it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, really great work, important work. Thank you. Okay. Okay. It's like saying goodbye at a party. You know, <laughs> the, host, the hostess. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you. I'm, I had my mic, my video off the entire time, but uh, I want to thank you. I am a photographer. Uh -huh. uh, photograph uh, Polish Jews since 1975. Um, some of my work is known, some isn't. Um, but I appreciate very much your this entire episode. This, Thank this you. Whole That's yeah, kind of I, to I, say. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've known Chuck through Facebook. I've never seen him physically, like as a person, only as a uh -huh. Facebook. Uh, a moment, a frozen moment, and his, his pictures are amazing. So. That's also another exhibition. <laughs> that, yeah, well, I'll, I'll look them up. Yeah, Fantastic. for sure. Yeah. You guys should yeah. definitely meet. <laughs> Let's keep in touch. And my friend, my college uh, yeah. roommate just sent me the chat, as usual. Uh -huh. So it, it's all I saved to, and I'll uh, pass it on. <laughs> I don't yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to reading through it. Of course, I... I saw little bits here and there, but yeah, yeah. I didn't get a picture of it at all. I'd be really interested. Hopefully, the, most of the comments were kind, so I'll enjoy yes. looking. <laughs> yes, for sure. If I want to. Okay, everybody, I think it's really time to go. Otherwise, we're going to be here all night. I've got a beer waiting in the fridge, so I'm off. Thank you again, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye, you, Paul. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Stay safe. Thank you.